Greetings. I hope and trust. I find you well, my dear friends, and welcome to the second installment of our broader series, Managing for the Master Till He Comes. And for this session, we are looking at a topic that is titled God's Covenants with Us. God's Covenants with Us. And uh, covenants are basically contracts, legally binding agreements. As we are going to go into this study, we want to appreciate that the moment you talk about a contract, there are certain issues that you cannot dispense with. Number one, you need to have a meeting of the minds. The Latin word is consensus ad idem. We must have a commonality of view, an agreement to some extent. And this agreement should be legally binding. What are the requirements for this agreement to be legally binding? Number one, it must be a contract that is entered by people who have capacity to enter into legal transactions. And what vitiates this um, capacity, amongst other things, would be A, um, someone who is a minor, an infant. So for one to get into a contract, they need to be of an age that can go into these legal contracts. So when someone is a minor, they will have to be assisted by someone who is a major or a guardian to go into this contract. So as we are starting this lesson, I want you to keep in mind that when God says, I want to go into contracts with people, God cannot be going into moral contracts with the infants. This already takes us into another doctrine, the baptism of infants. Infants cannot go into binding contracts unless they are assisted. So it, is, it should be someone who can make a decision that is informed and of proving that you have sound mind. So this brings us to point B. If you are inebriated, if you are drunk, or if you are someone who is a healthcare user, we don't want to say you have a mental issue. If you're a healthcare user or you're inebriated that you cannot understand what you're doing, that contract cannot take off because it lacks consent. It lacks valid consent. Even if you may have consented, it is not a valid consent. So as we take off, we want to appreciate that these contracts operate from a basis of capacity. Capacity. And what do these contracts do? Contracts, in essence, basically create or impose duties to perform. And after these duties have been performed, there is an obligation to deliver, to pay the promised sum or to deliver the promised goods. So a contract basically is a mode of self-regulating between the two parties. So we ordinarily exist in a tripartite relationship where there's, there's, there's the government and there are the contracting parties. The contracting parties could be uh, corporates to individuals or individuals to individuals or corporates to corporates. And you could have instances where it is the state and an individual or the state and a corporate. So you can look at all these varied nuances of the contractual relations. But as you look at these nuances, I want us to go back to the preamble and say the essence of the contract is to create legally binding relations. And these basically are incorporating duties and obligations. Rights are conferred and obligations either to confer certain rights or to restrain from infringing on certain rights are conferred by this contract. So as we come into this study, we want to look at um, Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 to 2. This is our memory text and the Bible provides as follows in the New King James Version. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Before we go into this study deeper, let us spend a moment together in prayer briefly. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, thank you, dear Lord, for the privilege of considering the terms and conditions of these contracts that you have entered with your loved ones. How we pray, dear Lord, 
that we may benefit from reviewing them so that you may inform our conduct and order our steps. This has been our prayer of faith. In Jesus' name we pray and we ask. Amen. The text we have just considered, Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 to 2, the whole chapter uses contractual language. We're going to come back to it as we look at the duties and obligations that it imposes, particularly the cover that it affords. But first of all, I want us to look at the duties and the obligations. Look at what duty this verse imposes. Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Obedience to the voice of God is the duty. Once that duty is performed, we want to look at what is promised. The moment we find that which is promised, then the contract is going to be semi-complete until we all agree to it. And the agreement might be by attesting, by signing somewhere, but you don't necessarily have to sign. A, a, a verbal agreement will still count for a contract in some instances. But of course, in, in business uh, trading, it ought to be reduced to writing. But um, for your labor employment, um, a verbal contract will still be binding. God says you should not, 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 not only obey his voice. Observe carefully all his commandments. Obey his voice. Observe carefully all his commandments. So the, 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 there's the issue of observation. There's the issue of due care, diligence, and then all his commandments. So we have a class of commandments. So when one is reading this with a contractual mind, you want to say, in as much as I should listen to the voice, you must distinguish it. You must be careful. As far as this class of commandments is concerned, you must identify it because it has not been broken down. So one has to go there and say, what are these commandments inclusive of? So as you go into these commandments, you're going to find that the Lord is going to do something. His obligations. What is he promising to do? What does he deliver in return? Set you high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings, there's a class again, they shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. So God is going to avail a certain class of blessings. We're going to look at this later on and say, what are these blessings and how does one begin to unlock them in terms of the contract? So this is um, a contract that is not being made uh, with uh, individuals at this point. It is being made with a nation. This is why we would ordinarily refer to it as a covenant. So even though people would uh, accent to it, they accent to it as a nation. That's why when you go into the book of uh, Exodus 20, you're going to find the children of Israel saying, whatever the Lord says, that we shall do. That is to accent to a covenant. It's as good as signing it. It is to agree to it. So when one looks at the contract, it will be incomplete without that agreement. So in as much as there is the duty, the obligation, you also need to have that agreement. And secondly, once there is a promise that has been extended, offered, and someone has performed, has acted in line with seeking to secure the promise, then legally there is what is known as a legal expectation. It is Barros 1983 who says when you go into contract language, basically there are three principles that underpin contract law. Number one, um, a performance that is engendered by a promise must be honored at all times. What it means is that where a duty has been performed in pursuance of an offer that has been extended, contract law is there to ensure that whatever was promised will be delivered. Secondly, where you have a harm that is wrongfully meted out, the person who has suffered harm must be compensated. Thirdly, no one should be unjustly enriched. What unjust enrichment speaks to basically is that you cannot benefit um, over another where you have not um, uh, contributed anything. 
towards whatever right or whatever benefit you have secured. So if you have done so, you have been unjustly enriched, you must return it to the one from whom you have taken this. So when we look at this, what does Paul then help us to appreciate? I want us to zero in on legal expectations. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 6 to 8, listen to this text. I know you know it so well. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. That's the preamble. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. What is um, so um, interesting about this is that uh, Paul gives us a glimpse into legal expectation. What Paul um, brings to our mind is that, number one, he has fought a good fight. Number two, he has finished his course. Number three, he has kept his faith. So what Paul is simply saying, using contractual language, this is the covenant and, and contract of salvation. Paul is saying there are certain duties that I have performed. And the duties that pertain to salvation are as follows. Fighting a good fight. Not every fight, but a good one. Number two, finishing the course. And number three, keeping the faith. When these are performed, what they cause in the mind of the believer is a legitimate expectation. And according to Barrows, where this performance is engendered by a promise, it must be honored. So Paul is simply saying, God, I have a legitimate expectation. And whosoever would have done things this way has every right to expect the same from God. And in spite of this expectation, he also makes something vividly clear. God is the righteous judge. So the standard is the righteousness of who? Of Christ. What will this righteousness of Christ entitle me to? It will entitle me to a crown, a crown in the heavens to come. So as we look at contractual language, God is the one who now has an obligation where we have done according to his bidding. Does this mean it's righteousness by works? An argument can ensue. But the issue is where one has done right. You have every condition in your favor to expect that what has been promised will be delivered. And the book of Revelation goes on to say, when we get to heaven, we shall be given crowns. We shall be given white stones. We have a promise that has been given. I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also. That is a promise. And when we order our lives in that way and we perform duties that have to do with faith, duties that have to do with running the course, duties that have to do with a good fight, we are going to have a legitimate expectation. And surely heaven must deliver on that. Here's the other principle that I, I want us to also consider here. An interesting one. The Bible also um, in Deuteronomy 28, gives us uh, verses that span from 1 up to 14. We're covering the blessings that we're going to receive. Blessings when you come in, blessings when you go out, blessings in the field, blessings in the city, blessings over your children. You're going to have people attack you from one direction and flee from you in seven directions. These are the kind of blessings that we're going to receive. And as you go later on into the chapter, you're going to find that there are curses that we receive when we do not obey the word of God. And the, the, the key text is hearken diligently to the word of God. Hearken diligently. Now the issue is um, when you go into contracts, you want to read the fine print. What do I mean by the fine print? We, we, I'm talking about that in um, your insurance contracts, in your medical cover contracts, in your funeral cover contracts. These are what you would refer to as standard form contracts. Your standard form contracts are the same for every client. So when you get there and you sign that contract, the contract is not unique to you. It's the same for everyone. But it details 
conditions that are going to prevail for you to receive the cover. For example, in automobile or, or automobile cover, you are covered within the territory where you generally domicile. So let's say I, I take an auto insurance for a car that I own and operate in Zimbabwe. When I am leaving the borders of Zimbabwe, I must go and have an international cover. If I don't activate the international cover but drive my car out of the country, I lose that car, it is stolen, or I'm involved in an accident. The cover that I had in Zimbabwe would not apply in South Africa, having driven the car over there, because that particular cover is for a defined scope. So when you go through a cover, you want to be sure that you have read the letter of the contract and be diligent enough to know that it does not cover these conditions. You could have your medical insurance. Your medical insurance, you're going to have a scenario where they'll tell you that you're going to receive cover up to so much. So when you exceed the limit, you begin to top up. Or when you exceed the limit and you exhaust the fund, you're not going to be covered anymore. So you need to hearken to this diligently. Know that there is a cover that you enjoy up to a certain extent. But if you go beyond, if you breach the cover, you will not enjoy it. So failure to hearken to it diligently results in you being not covered. So the same applies with this contract. God says, hearken diligently to my voice. When you go beyond its cover, you go into the territory of curses. If you are in um, contractual contract, I mean um, construction contracts, there is the four feature clause. What a four feature clause mean, simply means is, you know, you, you, you get buildings that are being built for years. It's supposed to be done within a year. You find that the building is under construction for 10 years and the constructor has not delivered on the promise. So the four feature clause basically says, if you do not meet the deadline, you're going to forfeit this certain percentage for failure to meet deadlines. So one has to hearken to the contract diligently to know that if I don't deliver as per the terms of the contract, I forfeit this percentage. By the time you get to the end of the contract, you may find that you are only going to earn 50% of it because you have lost it to penalties. Or if the house has a leakage, what would happen is there is a retention. They would retain maybe 10% of the contracted sum. So that's, you know, should you find out when the rainy season comes, that you didn't do just a good job, to, to do a just job. We can sue for recovery because of the shoddy work that you have done. The building is not fit for purpose. Or from the amount that would have retained, would engage someone else to finish the task. So this is contractual language. And God blesses us in um, Deuteronomy 28. And says, as you go through these blessings, hearken to them diligently because you go beyond the scope of the cover of the blessings. And if you breach this contract, there is a forfeiture clause, you will forfeit the blessings that you had and then revive the curses instead from verses 14 up to the end of the chapter. And then there's the other interesting issue that you find in the book of um, Proverbs. Proverbs 3 um, verses 9 up to 10. You, you can take it from verse 1 up to 10 actually. The wisest man says you shall honor the Lord with all the gifts and offerings that you have. Honor the Lord with these. You know, the, the interesting thing is that um, in our contract language, there is what is known as an honor clause. An honor clause is a, a situation where you are not anticipating to engage the courts to come and, um, and adjudicate should we have a disagreement. An honor clause is designed between people who trust each other. So as we get to the book of um, Proverbs, and God says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. This is not um, negligent. When you go into contracts with any other people, you're not negligent to make sure they are watertight. Because people often forget and people renege on the agreements that they enter. So you want to make sure that they are watertight. But God trusts us. He's saying, I don't want to go into um, a legally binding contract. I want to insert an honor clause 
and say, Honor the Lord with the substance of all thy increase. I trust you to do it. And he leaves it to us. He leaves it to us at our discretion. He doesn't prescribe how it should be done. So when you have an honor clause and you try and bring it before a court of law, the court is going to say you had no intention to be legally bound. So this would not apply ordinarily in, in a normal court process. But because we're using an honor clause with the Lord, the Lord says, I operate from a position of trust, not from a position of distrust. But when you enter into any other contract every other day, hmm, operate from a position of distrust, it, it will serve you better. Because when you operate from a position of trust, many, many a time, you may be cheated. You may be taken for granted. So operate from a position of distrust and make sure everything is written down. But God operates from a position of trust. That's why he adds this owner clause. And the other thing that he does after the owner clause is the reverse. The reverse of the owner clause. He uses what is known as an express reservation. Right. An express reservation would apply usually in property law. Let me give it um, a background of what an express reservation would look like. Uh, let's talk about an easement. You'd have two adjoining plots, plot one, plot two, but you have the main road on the other side of plot two. This person owns both plots and he wants to sell plot two, the one that is next to the main road. But in order to access the main road, he has a gate that connects plot one and plot two. So he sells plot two and reserves the easement of the road that gives him access to the main road. So when he has sold plot two, he has not sold the road. He has reserved access to the road. So the road has not been sold. So he can still use the gate reasonably so that he can close it when he comes through, open it whenever he can. That's an easement. So when we come to property law, listen to what God says. At Malachi 3, verses 7 to 11, I, 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 I know you know this. God says, bring the tithe unto the house of the Lord. Next week, we're going to be looking at the tithing contract. So I'm not going to spend more time on this, just mentioning it in passing. So God says, of all the property that I'm giving to you, I am making an express reservation on the 10%. I am not giving it away. I'm giving 90% to you, but the 10%, I am retaining it. That's an express reservation. So God makes this close clear and it is in writing in Malachi 3 verses 7 up to 10. So we have not been given access to the whole plot of land. To all the property, it's not 100%. We enjoy 90%. And you could even use it in the context of a house. You could have a scenario whereby uh, someone would say, I'm renting out this house, but I'm going to retain one room where I'm going to take all my property that is in this house and store it in that room so that I can be given access to come and check my property and store it in there as well for security reasons. That's an express reserve. So someone has given you a list of the whole house except one room. I hope this makes sense. So when we come to the tithe element, God has made it clear that he is going to retain that portion of the property that he has given. And of this property that he has given, there's also something that the author brings out here. He says, when you do this, test me, test me, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven such that when the blessings come flooding, you will not have a place, enough storage for these places. And he, and he raises yet another business term there. God is going to ensure that we have a surplus. We will not suffer a deficit when we abide by the tithing contract. This surplus is going to make sure that our stores will burst. We're not going to be able to contain everything that we have. This is a blessing that the Lord is giving unto each and every one of us as we go through this contract. Just to recap, the Bible is clear. There are obligations that are created by contracts. For example, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek you first, that is your duty. What shall be added unto you? All these things, that is the promise. When you perform God has an obligation to add all these things unto you. 
Go to 1 John 1 verse 9. If you are conscientious and you are faithful enough to confess all your sins, God is faithful. God is a covenant keeper to forgive you of all your transgressions, all your sins. Those are promises. Promise forgiveness of sin. What is the duty? Confession of sin. This is a contractual language. So when we begin to perform it, God has an obligation to come in and do the corresponding duty. So as we look at these contractual uh, relations that we have with God, what are we learning? What are we taking away? When we have performed diligently, God will reward. And he says, I am the true and faithful witness. He is truthful. He is faithful. He is the covenant keeper. As we go into these relationships, take note. As managers, we already have a contractual man, uh, I mean relationship with the master. And he has covered all these areas. Some of these areas affect how we operate. Some of these areas affect our retirement plans. Some of these areas affect what we are going to receive as packs while we're on the job. Those are the blessings. The retirement plan, salvation in the kingdom to come. These are some of the issues that we enjoy day in and day out and are at our disposal as we look at these contracts. Go back, consider the fine print in Deuteronomy 28 from chapter 1 right up to the end. See how far your cover goes and make sure you hearken to it diligently. Until we meet again next week where we look at the tithing contract, may the good Lord bless and keep you. Amen.